the NX1 was sitting not too far from the edge and the surface is pretty slick. He slid into it and it came right to the edge, teetering on the precipice of disaster. Other sponsors, Squarespace. Folks, remember, you can save 10% off the or your order by going to squarespace.com slash Toby. We love Squarespace. It is a fantastically easy way to set up a website. That's the first part, easy. The second part is you don't want some junky easy. You want some beautiful easy. And that's what Squarespace provides. And we'll come back and talk more about them a little bit later. And you folks, Patreon supporters, thank you. Really appreciate your investment in what we're doing here and it's making a difference and we have some exciting plans uh, and we need to update that one goal. We're gonna put in a thousand dollar goal which we are getting very close to and the growth there has been fantastic and I think in a large part thanks to these Lightroom videos that we're producing but thanks to you and your willingness to support us. Thank you. Great. So that's it for sponsors. Let's get on to some content. Okay. Um, so let's start by talking about last week's question of the week. What were the results of that? I don't see that listed in the rundown. Did I didn't you have go those? pull that up. Why don't we talk about the next thing? I have another let's little thing in the... Let's talk about what the question of the week, this week is, mm -hmm. uh, which is for the next year, you can only shoot at two focal lengths. Which ones would you choose? And where can they go to answer that? put that answer in a comment right down below great you can put it in the chat right now and you can discuss among yourselves but please come back and put it in the comments after the live show is over because remember those chat comments they add up but they don't actually show up under the youtube i wonder if youtube will ever change that uh, it would be nice to be able to go back and see that at some point uh, so uh, where did i put it on i don't remember i'll find it in a few minutes okay while we talk but that question, the current question, you can only shoot at two focal lengths for the next year. Don't think about lenses, just think about focal lengths themselves. What two are gonna do it for you? I'm curious. Great. Yeah. Um, so, well, can I give my answer and then you can give your answer too? Oh, I'm gonna give my answer next week. Oh, really? Yeah, you could give yours now if you'd like. Really? Mm-hmm. Okay, why not just wait till next week? Okay, wait till next week. All right. I didn't want to. I didn't want to shut you down completely. If you really were excited to share. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. I closed the wrong thing. Okay. So, in case you missed it this week, well, first we want to issue a small correction mm -hmm. from last week when we were talking about the Pentax 645Z. Um, you actually said that it was the Pentax 645D that the camera that I was referencing that I wanted to try out, but it, we actually meant the Pentax 645Z, which is the updated version, the successor to the 645D. So Yes, uh, I was showing the wrong one. You were. You thought I was showing the right one. I don't know, but yeah, eight grand, but nice. Yeah. Yep. And also as somebody pointed out in the comments, you know, I had made, made a mention of its uh, limited ISO range. Typically medium format cameras are really meant for studio work and work where you have controlled lighting situations and you're not worrying about shooting in lower light situations but the 645Z does have a decent ISO range yeah. and is much better and that's why one of the reasons why it would be fine for your wedding work. Yep and I'm not sure how relevant or what, what the context of this is but um, <laughs> Apparently Lightroom should be fine on four gigabytes of RAM. Well, we had the brief discussion last week. I feel a little snobby because I was like, because somebody asked about the new MacBooks that had recently come out oh, and whether right. or not Lightroom would run carefully, run well on them. And I was like, you really want 16 gigabytes. Well, there's quite a few people chimed in in the uh, comments that said they're running it with four gigabytes and it seems fine. I, all right, I'll meet you halfway and say, if you think you're going to end up with a bigger library or you're Miles, eight gigabytes is always going to be better, and 16 is going to be even more, but it seems like 16 probably is overkill. Eight is fine. Four seems manageable. Four definitely yep. is manageable. And then I had a couple other, you know, I, I like, I don't always get to write out responses to everybody's comments uh, from previous weeks, but I went back through real quick and pulled also um, David S., said we were talking about the discussion of the fusion of photos and videos, where I think in the future we're all going to be just shooting video and then pull frames out. And you were a little 
not so on board with that plan. No. But you had brought the news article to last week that said they are working on algorithms that determine pretty pictures. Mm -hmm. So David said, how about, don't you think we're going to have these things working together? And this is yes, exactly. And I've said this before, we are going to have software. We're going to have Lightroom version 15 is going to say, here is this 1000 frames you shot of the bride. Here are the 18 where her eyes are in sharp focus. Here are the 16 where her eyes are in sharp focus and she's got more of a smile. It's, it's going to have that type of smarts to it and it's going to pick out the good pictures for us. Okay. I mean, I just think that you are not always going to just want the picture that's in focus, that like where this particular thing is in focus. So yeah. it's a little bit less straightforward than that. And it, just because it can pick the photos that the, the general population deems as being the prettiest or the best doesn't mean that a particular artist who has a different vision and a different style isn't going to want to select something else. Sure, maybe it'll work for some people and some pictures, but it's not going to be like, I feel like people are saying that it's going to be this magical solution so that you never miss a shot because you'll be able to take video. But it also then it, it's not photography if you're just capturing video. That is not what photography is. Do you think, well, do you think there are some older film shooters that say digital is not, you're, you're starting to sound like you're stuck in this paradigm of the way it is now is the way it always has to be. Whereas film people probably feel like I had to very carefully choose my shots. I had 12 or 36. No, the I mean, most we're talking before. about capturing a still frame, which takes a different perspective and a different approach than capturing video and motion. Motion is completely different than, or motion picture is completely different than photos and photography. It's just, I just don't think that, I mean, sure, well, it's possible, but. I'll say there are people out there that want us to be on the more, on the same page more often, so we should probably end this discussion before, but, you know, what is different about firing a burst of frames versus holding the shutter down and it firing a burst so quick that it is basically video? I don't see a difference there except that we don't have good tools to work with that video burst to make pictures yet. Let's move on, because unless you want to say anything no, else. Okay. I think we've talked um, about one it. other thing is uh, Ancaster RFD said they really like Wi-Fi, and I wish I could remember where exactly I had that poll. Roy, Ruby, can you remember where I put that poll? I was on a post last week. Uh, again, thank you, gentlemen, for being in the room, virtually in the room. Uh, said that he really likes Wi-Fi. I think this is a heat. Uh, because they can shoot a frame, have it transfer to their high-res iPad, check it out, see if it looks the way they want, and then shoot. Because, and I hear this so often, people say, the pictures looked fine on the back of the camera, but when I got them on the computer screen, they were slightly out of focus, or I didn't feel like the exposure was just right. What's the deal? You know, even with these higher resolution screens on the cameras, they still are pitiful compared to a computer screen or a retina display on an iMac uh, or any high resolution display. And so that's a nice thought. And it got me thinking about the Aurora Borealis this week, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes too. Uh, and then Dennis from last week said he had the idea Dennis, you didn't uh, leave a reply button. Folks, when you do leave a comment, make sure, I think it has to be linked to your Google Plus or whatever so that I can reply. I can't always reply. I said, why don't you buy a cheap NX, like 2000, and then you can use that as your Wi-Fi transfer device. Whatever camera you're using, pop the card out, pop it into the other one, transfer it. See, right there, that sounds a little too complicated, Dennis. I want it to just work in the camera I have. You also said for 60 bucks on eBay, I didn't see any for less than 200 when I looked briefly. But it's not a terrible idea if somebody's desperate for Wi-Fi picking up one of these cheaper Wi-Fi enabled cameras. However, very commonly, many cameras will not read another camera's um, image file format. They'll say, I, what is this file? I can't do anything with it. And they're not, they're not gracious enough to say, I can't do anything with this file, but I'll still Wi-Fi transfer it for you. No, they're just like, mm, I can't see that. I don't know. That's what they're like. So. Um, so really quickly, if you are enjoying this, give it a quick thumbs up. Right. 
right down below. And uh, we love the interactions in the chat, but if you have any comments uh, or want to tell us something, leave it in the comments because the chat goes away, but the comments you'll be able to read later. So. Uh, and, you know, the segment started off as in case you missed it, and this week was fairly quiet uh, as far as you all are concerned. But behind the scenes, we had, well, I got my taxes done. That's always exciting. Super fun. <laughs> um, but the NX1 review, I think, will be out tomorrow. I just have to put finishing touches on editing it, and that was what I spent a lot of this week working on. Uh, and the Lightroom video, episode five, came out. Correct. Uh, this was another one from you. We're calling it Advanced and Creative Editing. And it really tone curves. That sounds... That's kind of, it, kind of sounds like a snooze fest to me. Tone curves. But... So no, it's not because I had to watch it to edit it. It's so fun. <laughs> You're so convincing. It's fun. It really is. I'll say this, I, I was, being sincere. you know, I've used them a little bit, but not to the degree that you would have, and fantastic in the level of control you have, the precision you have in both setting up contrast and color correcting with your tone curves. Fantastic. So take a moment, check that out. Patreon supporters, thank you again, and remember you got free access to it, so you should watch it and leave some feedback for us. And if you've bought it, take a moment and leave a review. Thank you. Now, let's dive into our... Wait, wait, wait. Before we move on, do we want to talk about our little uh, nighttime photographic adventure? Oh, let's talk about the Aurora Borealis for a moment. So, uh, was it Monday? Way back Monday. I think it was Tuesday. Monday or Tuesday, the news started blowing up that uh, there was a good chance of Aurora Borealis, in fact, over in Europe, uh, they were getting a good show, Iceland, really fantastic because of a giant solar flare that ejected from the sun, I think, on Saturday. F uh, the science behind all of this is fascinating. The way you get the colors, not as a photographer, but just the way the colors happen, amazing. It's just the little oxygen atoms getting so excited. And you like just, you actually see it. I didn't think, I thought that, you know, when you see those time lapses of it like moving really quickly, it definitely doesn't happen that quickly, but you can actually see the little spikes change and the mm -hmm. color and yeah. it's really cool. Yeah. It's definitely slower and more mellow, at least for us where we were, yeah. than, than you see in the pictures. Yeah, it's a lot more intense. I think it was probably a lot more intense in other places. Right, yeah. Um, so we headed out to a place that I knew had a good view of the northern skies with no towns or cities, Vermont, no cities at all until you way up Burlington, um, north of us. So we'd have a good dark sky. That was the first thing. And we ran out there with the 5D Mark III, the T5i, and that slider from the Nebo motion guys. I've been meaning to get outside with this thing at night because the question was, can you have it moving? This is, sorry, it's right over there. It's that motorized slider that will move a camera along as it's shooting a time lapse. Um, I put the T5i on that with the 10 to 18, which to be honest, and I said this in my review, is not the best lens for shooting the night sky because you're limited to t at 10 millimeters to f4.5. And that is an aperture that's not very wide, um, but it is what I use. And why, why does it have to be, why should it be wider? So that you can um, not, have, not have to crank your ISO high up. So, to so, allow more light yes, into the sensor. Let more light into yeah. the sensor. Um, I, if I had my choices, I would have a Tokina 11 to 16 f2.8 for those kind of wider shots uh, of the sky. Truthfully, I could have probably shot it zoomed in a little bit more than 10, so I could have gone to another lens. But anyway, it is what it is. I had Magic Lantern running on the T5i, so I was able to set up a little time lapse. And this, back to Ancaster's post of, I did quick, you know, off the cuff calculation. I think this is gonna get a good shot for me. It was about 20 seconds, ISO 1600. T5i definitely starts to get noisy up there. Um, and as I said, F4.5 at 10 millimeters. And I just started the time lapse software built into um, Magic Lantern and let it run. And I'm quite happy with the results of it. And I could actually, if you want to talk a little bit about shoot setting up the 5D Mark III, 
what we realized is left things like the intervalometer at home. Home was about 15 minutes away and um, trigger trap stuff would have been really nice to bring because it was very cold and very windy. I mean, like buffeting you gusts of wind. My fingers and getting everything set up were freezing. Somebody was in the car a lot. Hey, I don't want to be uncomfortable. <laughs> um, so we actually left. This is one of the nice things about living in Vermont. On this back road behind a snowbank, shooting the sky in the middle of the night, I left the T5i sitting on this Nebo motion slider while we drove home and back. And it took us about 45 minutes. It all ran the whole time and I have a little time lapse. Um, it, it's okay. It's certainly nothing amazing, um, but it's not too bad either. Uh, and let's see if I can pull it up here. Put any audio with it or anything yet, but let's see. I gotta go to Wirecast and share my screen. So, can you just turn quick. it back on? Yeah, well I can, but I wanted to just bring them back to me. Uh, there we go. Okay, so I know it went silent for a sec while you saw that. There was no sound. It is silent right now. Um, but so I, it's just kind of cool how it worked. And we also shot with the 5D Mark III. Yep. Uh, yeah, I mean, we had the 24 to 70 on it. And uh, I believe, I can't remember the settings really, but uh, you, you long went... shutter, 30 seconds. And um, I don't think that. You went up to like F9 or F10. Aperture. Yeah, I was I was not shooting wide open because yeah. I really wanted to get I don't know I just wanted to get right the stars and oh I'll say this the other thing that's really tricky with these STM lenses like the ten to eighteen the eighteen to one thirty five uh, there is no infinity focus with the twenty four to seventy on the five D Mark III you can look at the little focus indicator on the lens itself and say okay there's infinity and you can work with that until you get a sharp image. The 10 to 18 you don't, and so what I did was there was a house about a quarter of a mile away. I focused on a light manually, just held it up, magnified in, and focused. And with a lens that wide, focusing about a quarter to a half mile away is certainly at infinity, and so that was enough to get the stars in focus. Yep. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, so weekend review is done, and I have two windows open because... I am now using the chat as myself and not as him, Ooh. so as to not throw everybody oh. off. Um, oh, I need power. My power cord. Can you reach it? It's that white one that crosses in front of the lamp. We're gonna go under. Okay. This thing. So let's move on to news now. Adobe has released a new version of version 8.8 .8, and nothing too exciting has come with that update. Mostly just support for new cameras and lenses um, so that, you know, if you have the latest gear, then it'll be supported by Lightroom and Camera Raw. Right. This is, so, well, this is always a frustrating thing about buying cameras that have recently been released is that you can't open the raw files without in just straight in Lightroom. A uh, couple of the cameras that are worth repeating that are on this list is the Nikon D5500, the, the Lumix GF7, the Olympus OMD EM5 Mark II, and interestingly enough, the Canon 750 and 760D. These cameras aren't out yet, but they're on this list. I'm putting my tinfoil hat on and saying that Canon and uh, Adobe are in cahoots here a little bit to say, look how quickly we have all of this ready for you. Because Nikon, always waiting. The, uh, what, what was the other more recent camera that I had was in for review? I don't remember. But the Nikon D750, I think, as well. Uh, it, it was definitely after that camera was released and shipping before we got an update to Camera Raw that allowed us to open it. So Hasselblad Stellar 2 is on there, two Fuji films, and a Casio EXZR3500. New lens profiles uh, 
available too, the 100 to 400 Mark II, the Tamron 15 to 30, we'll talk more about that lens in a little bit, and some Voigtlanders from Leica, uh, a bunch of Tamron lenses for Sony cameras, and some Sony FE mount cameras as well, as a unique CG 2 GB. I have no idea what that is. That's listed under the lens section though. So, and some bug fixes. Magenta highlights when processing Canon 70D RAW files at some iOS hmm. settings. I don't know. Interesting. Uh, this, the next question is, when is Lightroom coming? We originally heard March 9th. The new and latest rumor is March 25th, which is what that Friday or Thursday, March 25th is Wednesday. So by this time next podcast, we should be hearing about it. And folks, remember if we're going to update those videos too to notify, you know, help you with any changes from what we've covered into Lightroom 6, the Lightroom yeah. videos I'm talking about. Our guess is that Lightroom 6 isn't going to be a whole lot different than right. Lightroom 5, so we may, maybe we'll add to start just a video to go yeah. over any of the new features, but... Well, th well, that'll be a free video. I'll be talking about all of the new features, right. but then we'll cover differences for those who have purchased or yeah. have access to. Yeah. Yeah. So... Yes, and Vincent reminds us from the chat room that Nikon has released their new version of their i. That's all I know. I saw that headline. I didn't look at it more. Okay. It's better. So kind of exciting news. If you are going to purchase the 5DS and 5DR, 5DS and R or 5DS and 5DX? No, 5DS and 5DSR. SR. Okay. Well, they are, uh, pre-orders are starting when? Monday? They will be available. Monday, Monday. 23rd. Yep. So... There it is. Put it on your calendar. At 12 a.m., get in line if you want to be guaranteed this to be shipping. Now, they're not shipping until what? Like mid-June-ish? Um, so you're going to be waiting a while, but at least you can now put in a pre-order. Canon really did announce this early on. Uh, and the thought is they really want to kind of stave off some of the bleeding to folks who are jumping to Sony's A7, A7R, uh, and... He's going to be announcing stuff soon, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes. Yep. And more 5D Mark IV rumors. I actually had to go back. I don't know how much we want to talk about this. I had to go back that we didn't already talk about it last week because it feels like almost every week we've talked about this to some yeah. degree. But um, Corey, well, Corey it, found stuff last Sunday, uh, and that triggered me to do a little bit of research, and I found some info and blogged about it last Sunday. So... The latest information is the 5D Mark IV is not going to be along until August or September. And this date is somewhat fluid based on how well the 5DS and 5DSR will, um, 5DR will sell. Uh, currently, the 5D Mark III is still selling very well, which I expect and um, it's true. Now, the rumored specs, 28 megapixels, 9 frames a second with 4K video and a significant advance in Canon's off-camera flash control, which is interesting. This is in contrast to a few weeks ago, we talked about the specs of an 18 megapixel, crazy high ISO, 61A of points, 12 frames per second, dual C fast cards, 4K video. And I said, no, this is not the 5D Mark IV. What we're seeing now, these rumors, this sounds in line with what I expect. 28 megapixels, nine frames a second, 4K video, I can, I can go with that. I can say that that is a definite possibility. I tell you though, I'm still on the fence about 4K. Not that they, not that I think they can't do it, but that they will have very soon a cinema, uh, and a more affordable cinema style camera that they'll want people to go to. And they, as they've shown from the 7D Mark II, really want to start putting these cameras into these clear niches. Like the 7D Mark II, that is clearly a wildlife and sports photography camera. Or the 5DS and 5DR, clearly high-end studio and landscape photography and have pitiful video functionality. So, but of teeth gnashing and moaning from the masses, including myself, if they really leave 4K video out of it um, and the 5D Mark IV kind of ends as that jack-of-all-trades camera that the 5D Mark III is, uh, it's it's going to be very noisy and it might hurt Canon. So I can still go either way. I haven't made up my mind, but I wouldn't be shocked if 4K is not in that camera. 
I wouldn't care. <laughs> um, so the D7200, the Nikon D7200 is now shipping. Yep. Can you remind us where does that camera fall and what niche that camera falls, if any? Well, that is, you know, that's, that's Nikon's um, top end crop sensor camera. Like um, the 7D Mark II maybe? It's not quite at the level of the 7D Mark II, okay. but it is, it's close. Its value is very good. It was, it's right away was Great deal when they like knock the hundred dollars off the price. Uh, it is a very good value with an excellent sensor in there. Shares the same sensor as the D5500, which you found to be great at higher ISOs. Uh, you know, it's it's a nice camera. Again, I said this last week, judging from information feedback I've gotten on my preview video, there isn't a huge amount of excitement about it because it is just kind of an upgrade from the D7100. It's a little bit better as upgrades usually are, but nothing like, oh my God, amazing. Right. So, but it's now shipping and it's a great value. If you're on a Nikon and you're on one of those lower level cameras, you want something a little bit meatier to put your hands on, a little better manual, manual controls. There you go. Yep. So, no more rumor mills or gear okay. news. Okay. Um, in the Washington Post, there was a, well, this week, the Google Doodle, I don't know if you guys yeah. saw what the Google Doodle was, was a cyanotype picture, a picture of a cyanotype. Um, so there was an article in the Washington Post just talking about um, kind of a little bit of the history of the cyanotype and the photographer that started it. And uh, it's pretty cool. It is. Yeah, I just wanted to mention it briefly because I thought it was interesting and I remember doing these as a kid. I don't know, did you ever do one of these as a kid? You got that little kit from like the Discovery Store and you get to set There this... were no Discovery Stores in Venezuela. Oh, it's okay. a <laughs> um, world country, basically. Um, you get to set out this paper and you put things on it in, in, in the sun and a few hours later you've made a print. So I just thought it was pretty and it's interesting. Um, and in the Lightroom 5 video, hey, let's make this about us. Lightroom 5 video, you show a little bit how to do kind of cyanotype yeah. tinted images. Not, not, I didn't touch or I didn't show how to do a cyanotype, but it's the same process as creating a sepia tone photo, which I did do. So um, it would just be, a, you'd choose a different color. So yeah, um, new, oh, just kidding. I lied. We are going to talk about gear some more and oh, some more rumors. rumors. Right. Uh, so NAB is coming and... What does NAB stand for, Christina? It's the National Association of Broadcasters. Nice job. Yes. Um, didn't even practice. <laughs> I didn't even practice that. Um, so uh, so, so a, Sony a, is... a video focused event usually. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Um, and Sony is releasing two new full frame sensor cameras. So we are excited about this because we really, really dig Sony sensors. We do, but at the same time, as um, I think it was Scott who put this into our rundown for us. Thank you, Scott. Uh, we got we got a lot of Sony full frame cameras right now. We've got the E mounts, we've got the A mounts, and these A mount folks. Those are the ones that look more DSLR like that use the translucent mirror technology. They have not gotten much love from Sony recently. Uh, and they're doing fine on bodies, but we need more lenses. We need more lenses on the FE mounts or the E mount side. Um, oh gosh, they just, they're coming out with bodies so quickly that it's a little bit of, well, I don't know what it is. It's just, they need to slow down a little bit. They need to focus on the lenses so that they grow their ecosystem and become more of this uh, option for true professionals in a variety of different fields. Right now, you know, there's a few, well, there's, there's a significant number of professional style lenses, but not as many as Canon or Nikon. So it's interesting. Uh, it sounds like that these are going to be uh, soft announcements. So they just kind of kind of slipped into the product stream with maybe a press release, no big uh, keynote speeches or anything like that. And we'll see one in early April, which that's like a week away and one in May. Yeah? Yep. Okay. Okay, next thing. So you're trying to do two things here. I know. Um, Can't be the chat room monkey so all the time. So an article that it wasn't on a photography related website is, it was on xojane.com actually. The article was titled, live like an Instagram fashion girl. And mm. 
it was interesting and it's relevant because, well, Instagram is an app that allows you to share photographs, but also it kind of talk a little bit about a couple of little known tips for posting pictures on Instagram in order to get better, I want to say conversions, if that's the right word. Um, so one of the things was that apparently photos with white space in the background allegedly get more likes as they provide visual relief while scrolling through endless photos. Also, photographs with blue in them click best because hmm. that's a really popular color. Okay. So, so we should take a picture kind of, of a picture on Instagram. our mugs with this nice blueness on a white background and it should get a million likes. Sure, yeah. <laughs> a million likes. A million likes. I'm sure some people got You know, I, did, I put it in the rundown. I don't think we're going to talk about it briefly, but Kanye West, I don't remember where I saw this. Um, I it wasn't I don't read too many trashy websites, but somehow this came up in my feed that Kanye West went on a crazy little rant this week and one of the things he posted was these kind of half naked pictures of Kim Kardashian. But what I was interested in is they are screenshots of pictures of her in in an editing program. And what program did we decide it was? Phase uh, capture one? Capture one. So Yeah, that's what I think it was. Did you confirm? I yes. I did, I went and found Capture One. So they weren't using Lightroom. I was like, well, if they're not using Lightroom, what are they using? And they're using Capture One, which is probably the, the, the number two choice of professionals, wouldn't you say? Especially medium format. It's really designed for working with large medium format files. That's all. What's next on our list, Christina? You can look at the rundown and tell me while I answer this question in the chat. Okay. Um, we got the Sony Alpha rumors. We've got the Kanye West and then, hey, did you know that bugs are capable of long exposures? That's really cool. Is capable of long exposures seeing in the dark. And this is an article from Petapixel this week put in here um, by Scott. And it says, Scientific America reports that researchers at the University of Ulu in Finland inserted a harmless recording instrument into a roach's eyeball. All right, I'm not a big fan of roaches, but how do we know for sure that it was harmless? Um, in order to document the electrical signals that are generated when the photoreceptor cells detect an incoming photon. They found cockroaches' eyes are able to absorb one photon every 10 seconds in a conditions equivalent to a moonless night. Although humans and most creatures wouldn't be able to process light signals at that rate, cockroaches pool the photon signals they detect over time, forming a long exposure image of the scene that allows them to see the world. A nocturnal bee and a dung beetle are reportedly two other insects that are known to use similar long exposure video techniques in the dark. That's pretty interesting. Uh, so do they have to remain motionless or do they get a bunch of blurry images? Can you think about the headache you would get if you had to stay still to see and then move to see? That would. I would get a headache from that. I don't think anybody could hear you. You just talk so softly. Um, that reminds me of the old, like, sit around the campfire trick we used to do at camp. And that is, and I don't remember exactly the, the reason why this works, um, but if you, in a low light condition, stare at an object, don't blink, don't move your eyes, that object starts to fade away. And I believe the reason why is we've got the cones and we've got the rods, and one of them is responsible for, uh, well, one of them, doesn't work very well in low light. And when you don't move, that is the one that's getting used the most and you kind of lose your vision of whatever you're looking at. But by moving your eyes constantly, you are using all of the other bits that do an okay job and you can continue to see even in lower light. So take a few moments in a dark room, stare, it doesn't have to be a dark room, but a low light room, stare at something and it will slowly fade out of you. The other fun thing to do is you could do the one eye thing and for like 15 minutes, you keep this eye covered and then you uncover it in the difference in a dark room and the difference between night, the one that vision and the other one. I'm telling this terrible. Stare at a light source for like 15 minutes. No, don't stare at a light no, source. No. It'll ruin your vision. Well, what are you trying to do? <laughs> uh, well, you could like a candle or a okay, light or okay, the TV okay. even. And then or just have remove the light on. or just have the light on. Right. 
and then remove, turn the light off, remove, and the difference in night vision. People forget, and this was true with the Aurora Borealis the other night, it takes our eyes mm -hmm. like 15, 20 minutes to really adjust. You get a quick adjustment that helps, but if you let it adjust longer, the difference is significant in what your two eyes can see. So from long exposure cockroaches, so I mean, well, holding still a nocturnal bean of bee, bee, I can't, he can't be doing that while he's flying around. That doesn't sound like it would work very well. I don't know. It's curious. It's interesting. Good. Okay. And last thing on our new section, uh, there's this new software that lets you make micro adjustments mm -hmm. on your computer. Yeah. Uh, How does it work? Focal will communicate with, now it doesn't work perfectly with all cameras in. I have to find, there it is. It's made by these folks at Rikan. Um, they're a UK based company. And it is software that will help you calibrate your camera. Now it doesn't work. Well, one, their latest release, which is much better, is not Mac compatible at this time. They're working on the Windows version first, then they're going to port it over to Mac. So that's a little annoying. Pretty much 90% of the comments are people saying, I want the Mac version. Um, but it, you buy it, it sets up a little test chart for you. You shoot the test chart with your lenses and it helps you do your micro focus adjustments and calibrations. What's neat about version two is that it knows how sharp your lens is and it will report back to the mothership and will tell you other people who have shot the same lens. I'll tell you other people that have shot the same lens. I'm just showing people the same silly picture. So i uh, see if there's, here's something better to look at. Um, how your lens compares to other people's lenses. This is kind of like the ultimate pixel peeping because up till now, we've basically been like, I, here's a brick wall, you shoot a brick wall too, we'll look at them together, can we tell? No, because there's so many variables in figuring out exactly uh, unless you have a scientific condition chart. And this still has some variables because of your setup and a lot of different things, but the, the software accounts for many of those and gives you really good results and then helps you do your micro focus adjustments. And it's funny actually, it's not able to communicate with the 5D Mark III, but it's got voice prompts that will say, adjust plus one, adjust plus one. You do that and it continues to read and then until you nail the software in and get it all working. So I think that's neat. Windows folks, you can go check it out. Um, and they're, they're, it's like 80, 80 euros, uh, it's not cheap, but if you're somebody who wants to spend time uh, making sure your lenses are as sharp as possible with your camera systems, it's actually not that expensive for that. It's nice. So I might reach out to them and see if we can get a test copy. We need a Windows machine to test it on. We're mostly only Macs. You could run it in virtual software. Via, uh, they do mention that. You could run it in Parallels or uh, Nerd Talk Alert. Fusion Box or I don't know, something like that. So. Cool. Well, let's briefly get things done. talk about our sponsors today, or Ace, our sponsor. Yeah, we want to talk uh, for a few more minutes about Squarespace, which is what I'm showing right here. And I had Wesley's page open somewhere in here, but I can go to the rundown. That's all everybody can see and say. Here it is. So Wesley reached out to me and, you know, you can do this folks. You reach out to me and say, here, here is my cool Squarespace site I used signing up with your code. You want to take a look at it? And you know, you do me a favor like that, supporting our sponsors, and I can often make an effort to do a favor for you. Now, Wesley is using one of that same template or uh, design that I showed last week, uh, or two weeks ago now, I think it was, uh, that greets you with this beautiful, gorgeous, full page ad. And let's, you know, let's make it a little bit bigger on the screen. You don't need all that space. Um, and it's just, it looks fantastic. This is a cool shot. I like the shot you got up here, Wesley. Uh, we, and we could critique it a little bit too, but um, it is a combination of advertisement for Squarespace right now and critique. Maybe we'll be light on the critique. So you jump into the photography. So you got the choice about on that front page and we're in here now into these individual galleries and it is very cool. Uh, I just love how it fits them all together. And again, Wesley didn't do anything complicated. He just chose this design and then started throwing his content in here and it makes all of the work happen. All of the back end stuff just happens. And we don't have any way to show you, but if you pull 
Wesley's site up on a mobile device, it's going to look just as gorgeous. It's automatically going to be responsive and give you um, just what you need to see. Now, we've been talking about this a little bit. Let's come back to us for a second. Google is, as of April 1st, is going to start really calculating in mobile friendliness of sites in its search result rankings. Remember that? Remember this discussion? Briefly. I'm sorry, I was reading the chat and was very distracted. Repeat. Google is going to start um, factoring in mobile That's friendly right. design yeah. into its ranking. Sites that are very unmobile friendly are going to take a hit, especially on the mobile side. I don't know if they're going to penalize them on the desktop side. That seems a little mean, but you got to have your site optimized for mobile devices and Squarespace yeah. just does it. You don't do anything other than put your content in there. Squarespace takes care of it. It is mobile ready, mobile friendly and responsive design. Folks on Squarespace will not be taking any type of hit from their search engine rankings on Google. So uh, I think that's just really cool. If we come back here now, I noticed Wesley's got some beautiful work on here. I'll say that and some really nice stuff. There seems to be some static coming from your mic or maybe my mic. We got it plugged in. And Let us know if that fixed it, folks. I wasn't. I didn't actually do anything, so we'll just hope it's fixed. Um, beautiful work here, and I don't remember where I saw it. Was it on the blog, Wesley? You had a um, oh, you have your new gear and your camera settings, and that's all very exciting. Oh, and your video right here. But someplace you had a cool, ah yeah, I enjoy taking time lapses. So you've linked off, and now this is fine, but I'm gonna use this as an example uh, of, a, of what you can do in Squarespace. So you've linked off to this fantastic time lapse that you've shot above the fog. You shot it with a T3i and uh, Whoa, some other gear. that is a cool time lapse. Yes. yes, it's very nice. We'll skip forward a little bit, because, and there's audio too, but I don't think you all are getting the audio, you're only getting ours. There's some good music with it. Let's skip forward a little bit more to show you some of the other stuff. Yeah, really nice job, Wesley. Good work, good post-processing, looks great. But I think right now you've just lost everybody. They've all ended up now on Vimeo. And there's no way back to your website other than, well, you actually have that open in a new tab, which is fine. So I just wanted to show people briefly. Okay, hang on. I think the sound might be screwy on this screen or something. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. Christina figured it out. Okay, so I just want to show briefly how easy it is to take um, a video and get it into Squarespace. And I'm going to show one thing that it does that I love because there's something YouTube does that I really dislike. So we're in here. I've got this one picture. See the world through my lens. A little cheesy, blah, blah, blah. Let's, do, let's go to our About page, just like Wesley had. And on this about page, I want to insert um, some new content. So page content, I want to click the little edit button. We're into this little editing thing here. And we can come down. Actually, where is it? Am I going to embarrass myself? There we go. We're going to, right here, we're going to click this uh, okay. little eyedropper. No, sound is still bad. Sorry. Um, I, it's... Listed is fine, and we're getting fine there, and it sounds fine. Maybe let's, let's unplug it for a second. One, two, one, two, test, test, one, two, one, two. Looks like it's okay. What are people hearing? There's no batteries. No batteries. I just unplugged it and it's back. And what are we saying? Yes, no, maybe. Let's switch back over here for a second. Yes, no, maybe. No, Dalibor says no bad. Just Toby, loads okay. of static. Well, we may have to just restart this, which no, is always no. super fun. We shouldn't have to restart. Now, I know Corey had the suggestion. He said, really, you should ditch your lav mics last week. But we cannot use and use... Um... Oh, it's fixed. Why? 
Yeah, see, no that's idea. That's frustrating. No I idea. I definitely don't love this task cam device, but a couple of things I'll talk about because you know we're obviously suffering from this issue. The lav mics give us the best quality in this room. Absolute, no questions about it. I've tried a lot of other things. I've got a lot of fan noise from my computer. But what we run into, I think, is how to get this content, this audio, into Wirecast. And I'm using this little Tascam US322. I'm not a huge fan of it. I'm not a huge fan of it. So, good. Okay, it sounds good. Let's get back to talking briefly about our sponsor. And I'm going to repeat myself briefly here and say that I want to show you, I just showed you Wesley's beautiful stuff. You didn't have to hear what I was saying. You just could look at it and see it was beautiful. Um, but as one, as one Vimeo took you off the site, I want to show you how easy it is to add a video into Squarespace and give it a custom thumbnail because so often I will post a video onto my page and YouTube's thumbnail is just an automatic one. And even after I go to YouTube and say, you know, here's the right thumbnail to use, the ones outside that get pulled on Facebook, on my personal pages, my blog, still use the old thumbnail and it drives me crazy. So I'm here editing my about page. Uh, all I did was click the edit button. I've clicked this little dropper and I'm gonna insert a video. So all I have to do is put the URL of the video in there and I've got my Aurora one right here. So I'm just gonna grab this URL and stick it in here. And look at this, right down below, whew, that looks noisy, but right down below is a way to add thumbnail. So I can grab, I can click this, and I can go, and I think I did in my photos folder earlier today. I go to, no, Just so you know, you're broadcasting yourself still. Oh, I thought I'd switch back. Here we go, one more time. All right, let me show that. Let me cancel this. Okay, we're on the about page. I'm going to click on the little edit button and then click on the little dropper right here and say add a video. Enter the video URL. Now I've already copied the URL from the YouTube page. You don't have to worry about the embed code or anything like that. It's just the regular URL in the browser. I'm gonna paste it in there, and now I can add a thumbnail. So, you know, this URL, or this thumbnail is really rough looking, actually. Um, so I'm gonna go get a nicer picture, and I did a nicer one. I have my Dropbox folder full of photos right here, and I think this one right here, um, yesterday at 338, is a nicer one. So just like that, you don't have to worry about what thumbnail YouTube is pulling or Squarespace is pulling, but there you go, you're gonna have a custom thumbnail which looks a lot better. Now, you probably want it to represent what's on the page and you could also customize it and put a little play button on top of it, but we're gonna just come down here and say use that custom thumbnail and just like that. Oh, and they even put a little play button on it for you. You could put a little caption in here, Aurora Borealis and save. And it's just that simple. I now have a beautiful video embedded in Squarespace. Let's go over those steps again. I got the URL, I edited the page, I said add a video, I pasted the URL, and then I gave it a custom thumbnail. Like five steps to have a gorgeous video embedded in the page. And again, responsive design, this is gonna look good on a mobile device as well. If you're interested in checking out Squarespace, take a few moments, squarespace.com slash Toby, free two-week trial. That's how convinced they are that it's going to work well for you. You don't have to, it's not one of those trials where you have to remember to cancel it or you're going to start getting charged. It's completely free, no credit card required. Squarespace.com slash Toby. Save 10% off your order. We thank them for their support. Yep. Whew. Sorry about that audio issue yeah. too. That's really frustrating. It's the fun of a live show. Okay, so Slate has an article which I seem to have missed until now. Well, Tell us about it. We've talked about space weather. We talked about the Aurora Borealis, and I was excited about the fact that those colors come from the different oxygen atoms getting excited by the energy from the sun. Um, but we also today, in certain parts of the world, had a solar eclipse, which sounds like most of the areas were kind of skunked out with clouds. But 
some people got to see some things. Dude, actually I don't know for sure that it was a dude, um, took a video of the solar eclipse while the ISS Test, nope. test, 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 oh. test. There it goes. And it's back now. Yeah. Randomly. Yeah. It's this Tascam US322. I'm going to get my money back and uh, get something better. Sounds like your plan. Right. Well, I mean, we've had other audio issues in the past, but that was those were different. That was when we were piping it into the computer and then using the software to monoize it. And that software was having issues. Do you guys remember the District 9 crackling? The District 9 crackling. Score fun times. Yep. I want the sequel to that. I uh, might not still, might still be quiet for them. Um, I think it's, just give it a minute. They're, you know, they're, they're like 30 oh, seconds behind us. Yeah. I know, but when we change. I that. know. Okay. So what was I going to say? So our discussion, let's move on to discussion and yeah. hope that the sound doesn't go away. Yeah. Um, so we are going to talk about one of my favorite people, Ira, Ira Glass. Ira Glass. And his quote, which is actually a quote that I had heard before about the creative process. And are you, were you going to play the video? Or? I was not going to play the video. Okay. I was going to tell people to go watch it and I was going to summarize it. You should go watch it because he just has a, a, just a really nice way of telling stories and words and saying things. So, yeah. but I'm going to try to read it too so we can talk about it right uh, can i can i just summarize it because i'm realizing now we're about an hour in and we're oh sure do your questions yeah that's fine so it basically he basically says people don't tell you this but when you're starting out and i think people do to some degree when you're starting out you're going to suck you're going to suck for quite a while you're going to struggle for maybe years at anything creative that you're trying to tackle and it's going to take you some time to get better. Now, we've talked about this before, and last week we had that inspirational quote that says, just get out there and start doing it, and you'll learn stuff, and I think that's great. But I think this is a nice kind of uh, counterbalance to that because I think people expect themselves to pick up a camera and take beautiful pictures right away, and it's not going to happen. But the other thing that I was thinking about while I was reading this is that I think, and for photography, there is a little bit of a dangerous thing that happens in that people think they're much better than they are early on. Yeah. There is this kind of disillusionment of you get a couple good shots, maybe lucky, maybe you just did a really good shot, and you think you are on the way to awesomeness. And then that makes the subsequent sucking for a while even more frustrating. Yeah. Or you just continue to be disillusioned and think you're awesome. I have people send me pictures from time to time that they think is awesome. And it's not a bad picture, but it's just a picture like any other picture I've seen that day, that week, that month. So, you know, you just got to realize, what's my point here? Point is, don't give up. Because yeah. like we have said before, we actually, I think, talked about it last week. It takes you know the the rule of thumb is that it takes about 10,000 hours of work it takes you putting in about 10,000 hours of work to master 
any given craft, whatever it is, whether it's photography or graphic design or anything. So I think that it's really good to have goals and it's really easy to be disappointed because you're not getting the results that you want right away. But the truth of the matter is that you have to put in the time to get better and to improve and to grow. And the other thing along with that is that, you know, I'll say another quote that I've heard a lot and that is comparison is the thief of joy. And I can't mm. remember, it was a really big person in history that said that I want to say like Thomas Jefferson, maybe I can't remember, but, um, Theodore here, Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt. Um, and it's so true. I mean, I do this, I compare myself to other photographers that I admire, and the truth is that when I look back at my old work, I see so much growth, so much improvement, that the only person that I really should be comparing myself against is just myself. So, and again, that's something that you're going to be able to see over time, the more you create, the more pictures you create, and this goes, I think, right along with the quote from last week, which was that you know artists like art doesn't come from inspiration artists comes from work from sitting down and process. actually getting to work right. and yeah and being involved in the process so kind of maybe you start getting a theme here that you just have to go out there and do stuff and not get bogged down in the details and not beat yourself up about not being as good as you hope that you are or that you wish to be because we all struggle with the same thing at whatever level you're at, uh, you're always going to want to wish to be much better. So, yep. You know, I just divided 10,000 by 24 because I was curious how many days is that? It's mm -hmm. 416 days. Now, that doesn't mean in a year you're going to be better. We're talking complete 100% day dedicated. So, you got to take that futuristic pill that doesn't require sleep, and then you just keep shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting. I saw another interesting quote today that said, uh, or this week, it was that, um, you know, learning doesn't come from doing, it comes from reflecting on the doing. And I think that ties in nicely with one of our tips last week, and that is go out and shoot a bunch, but then come back and you have to look at those pictures and look at the metadata to kind of digest what you captured, how it was captured. And you know what, the metadata is really only half the story because that doesn't account for things like composition and stuff like that, but it's part of the story that's important and you gotta get that down so that you can have technically, and, uh, technically competent photos to be able to get the other type of photos. Okay. Yep, so now we're gonna move on to questions, viewer questions, oh. and let's take a look at here. You know, there was one other thing I wanted to say about weather sealing, but we'll save that for next week. Just fact, when you see weather sealing listed, I've been doing a lot of research in the last couple of weeks. Weather sealing listed, really, it can mean a wide range of stuff. Thinking back to my 5D Mark III, you know, it wasn't because that Sigma lens was on there. I thought you were going to talk about it next week. I had issues. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to talk about it next week. Okay. All right. So John Inglis wants some recommendations for video captures or screen capture software for Windows. Yep. Cam Studio is a free software that I've used in the past. I just went and looked at it before the podcast. It has not been updated in about two years, but it's still a very capable and completely free software that will do a decent job. If you're going to be making money at this or you want them to have a more professional polish, something like Camtasia, which has a Mac and a PC option, will work for you as well. For those who are on Mac side, John didn't ask about this, but ScreenFlow is kind of the de facto, de facto standard. Very nice software. You can edit all within the software, so it's not only capturing, but gives you an edit as well. If you Google ScreenFlow for Windows, what comes up does not look very good. Not, I mean, not, it's not like sketchy or anything, but it just doesn't look like... It's not by the same company, although they're using the same name. So, there you go. Yep. Next question from Walter Real. He says, Toby, oh. what? I thought you were going to, I didn't know why that, what was that long pause for? Oh, well, I was just, I was trying to get to a question. Okay. Um, 
not sure if you've done anything on this topic, but maybe the subject of an, uh, what are your guidelines, recommendations for converting 35 millimeter slides to digital images and how to get reasonably sized best quality images for long-term archives? Roy nicely is working on a post that's going to answer this question. Awesome. Yes. And I'll, tell you, I'll be honest, uh, I would be inclined with a very large amount to send them off someplace to scan cafe because it is a huge amount of work. Now, if you want to do this work, if you're you're looking forward to it and or you don't trust somebody else with sending stuff out, um, then you can. But it's going to be a lot of color correcting to get them all looking good. I did this project a couple of years ago. Uh, not not too many, but for the college I worked at, they needed, I don't know, a couple hundred. And I ended up using a macro lens with the slides on a nice light table and just shooting them uh, with a macro lens. The slide scanner I used was a really nice Nikon one, but it kept jamming again and again and again, and it was just miserable. So I ended up doing it kind of manually. So Walter, look out for Roy's post. That'll be up sometime soon. Yep. Um, Say so it wants to know, when taking photos in low light, how can I eliminate or limit the amount of blowout I get when photographing scenes with artificial lights such as lamps or street lights? I want to avoid this blowout with lamps. How can I achieve this? So, buy a Sony. Oh, <laughs> it's it's all about that dynamic. Wrong. It's all about that dynamic range. But yes, it's about dynamic range. And while you know, current Nikon, Canon cameras. So unless you have that, maybe the Samsung NX1 or the Sony 7R S7R. I don't. A7R, A7R, yeah, yeah. A7S. So unless you have those, you, and even when you have those cameras, I mean, you're talking about several different stops of light between the shadows and the highlights in a low light situation. So you have really, one, you can use flash to fill in, and two, you have to really try to expose as evenly for the highlights and the shadows as you can and then try to maybe bring those back in. There's no like one quick, there's no quick fix for this. You have to either try to expose evenly for the highlights and the shadows or my other suggestion would be to take multiple shots if you can on a tripod and then try to combine those later in Photoshop. Yeah, so an HDR. An HDR, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So. That, that's how you can take, you can prevent blowout of the highlights in uh, low light situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, I'm skipping down just because I saw Wesley, who we just shared his wonderful Squarespace site. How often do we use mirror lockup? Uh, I'd say not very often. I usually use it when shooting longer exposures. So for those who don't know, when you take a DSLR picture, two things happen in there. We're gonna, we're gonna simplify it and say two things happen. The mirror flips up out of the way so that the light coming through the lens can hit the sensor, and then the shutter opens and closes, and the mirror flips back down. That process of the mirror flipping up causes some vibration in the camera, and at certain shutter speeds can blur your images if it's on a tripod. We're talking shutter speeds that are usually around um, a quarter of a second to a full second. Shorter shutter speeds than that aren't affected. Longer shutter speeds than that usually aren't affected because the shake settles out and the image is burning into the sensor without the shake happening and so you get sharp enough. Uh, there's been some neat experiments where people put little laser pointers on top of their camera and then shoot and see how much it wiggles on the wall and things like that. Anytime I'm using a shutter speed where I just said about a quarter second to one second on a tripod, I will try to enable mirror lockup, or I will. The other thing you can do is if you shoot in live view, the mirror is already up, and so you've kind of negated that lockup necessary. So more and more often these days, I'm just shooting in live view because it does the good enough job. Um, yeah, time lapses. See, that time lapses gets get tricky because you can't really keep that. I don't think many cameras will let you keep the mirror up, and this is where mirrorless cameras start to really come into their own is one of the options that are nice. So, Panos wants to know a good lens, a good macro lens for Nikon. 
Uh, you've already got the 18 to 130 and the 35. So because you've got the 35, I'm not going to recommend the 40 macro, but that is a fantastic for the money lens. The only thing I don't love about it is the manual focusing ring gets a little sticky. And with a macro lens, you want it to be smooth. So those tiny, tiny little adjustments that make huge changes in your depth of field at those distances. So uh, next one that I would probably go to, the Tamron 90 is a very good lens for the money. That was part of my macro lens. Um, in that case, I was using it on a Canon, but that's about $499, I believe, and that's a fantastic lens with VC vibration compensation. I actually think the 499 might be without VC. The 799 might be with. I'll look that up in a second. Um, but Tamron's 90 millimeter lens is excellent, and Nikon's got a little bit of a longer one as well. They got 105 that is fantastic, but that's getting quite expensive and probably a little bit more than you want to spend. So. The 40, if you don't mind having overlap or very close to your 30, but I'd go with a 90, spend a little bit more. Yep. Mikhail has a question for you. <laughs> I don't think you have an answer to that. Uh, how good is the Canon 300 millimeter F4L on a crop? We haven't shot with that lens on a crop sensor. Uh, I hear really good things about it. It's good. On a crop sensor, what are you out at? You're at four something, 470-ish, uh, depending on what sensor you're working with. That's a good bit of reach, and it's a good lens. Good. Do you have another question? Because I gotta go dig up the Facebook questions too. Yep, uh, yeah. I already did that, unless there's another post. There was another post uh, oh, okay. earlier this week. So Vincent asks, what does Facebook do to perfectly edit photos that turns them to average dull rubbish? Even the smartphones take better and vastly sharper photos than the Facebook renders to its timeline. Uh, yes. Uh, well, that's not really an answer to your question, actually. But it, that does happen, and it drives me completely crazy because I'm very nitpicky about the quality of my pictures. And when they're exported and then uploaded to Facebook and they don't look the same as I exported them, it drives me completely nuts. I don't really know what to do. I've experienced different resolutions I've experimented with and it seems like it changes over time too like for a while there was there was a period of time when I was uploading photos that were a certain size and then all of a sudden like a month later the same exact resolution and exports looked horrible so I don't really know what the answer to that is I have googled I have I mean this is something that I really researched because I upload pictures to Facebook all the time and I want them to retain the quality that I export them at. So I feel like I had found recently a setting that was working really well for me and it's actually going to be in the next Lightroom video when we talk about exporting from Lightroom. Um, but 2400 uh, pixels as its longest, so that, that's a setting in Lightroom you can say, make sure that the longest side of this image is no more than 2400 megapixels. Sorry pixels uh, and 72 dpi and they seem to look good oh and also what was it um 16 by 10 16 by 10 seemed to fit in that news feed really nicely so in facebook's wow. defense i don't really want to come to the defense of facebook but the sheer number of images being uploaded every day to facebook is jaw dropping and so they compress the heck out of them so that they don't have to buy 8 billion terabytes a second of storage. I'm just throwing all kinds of numbers around. So that's the defense of why they are compressing our images. But yes, golly. And it's one of the reasons, one of the several reasons why I wish Google Plus had survived or not that they're completely dead, but they basically are uh, because they display your images so nicely. They still yeah. do. And that whole photo part is going to be split off, but nobody goes there. Everybody's on Facebook. So you got to put them on Facebook. Yep. Yeah. Auntie Van wants to know what is the best filter to buy to start with. You have? Do you have an LV filter? I feel like you do. I did. I just bought a cheap Tiffin 0.9. Mm -hmm. I've been happy with it. I don't have to use it. I don't use it a ton. If I was, if if you're serious about it though, and you just well, yeah, get a 0.9 because that is dark enough to make a serious difference. Any darker than that, and you run into some situations having to have too long of a shutter speed or change your aperture. Uh, if you really want to, you could go with a nice 
uh, like sing ray neutral, a variable neutral density. It lets you dial in the amount of changes you want. Yep. It's basically two circular polarizers. That's mostly for video folks, though, to give them the most amount of freedom in shooting. If you're just photos, a 0.9 is fine. You can go a little bit darker, but it's fine. Yep. Um, and the last question, well, one really? of the last yeah. few questions we have on here. Yes, it's 6.40. So we are running very, very late. Um, weddings and portraits, dot, 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 back button focus, or back focus button. Back focus button. Same What thing. are you saying? <laughs> so this person, uh, Willie, wants to know uh, who uses back button focus and for us to talk about it. Yes, I use it all the time. Um, I've set up my camera to have back button focus. It's way better than shutter button focus because it lets you maintain your focus and take multiple pictures as opposed to refocusing every time that you move the camera. So. Definitely would recommend it. And do you have a video on how to set that up? At I all? have a video that talks about it for some different cameras. I have a post on my site. So just go and search for back button focus. I'll say it's it takes a little getting used to, but then it's one of those things where you feel like you can't live without it. Anytime, and this is pretty much any of us who are watching this podcast, video cast, whatever, um, anytime you're taking a couple of pictures in a row where your subject doesn't really move, back button focus is really nice. Why? Because you get focus and then you take those couple of pictures. If, if you just have it set up default, you take a picture and then you go to take another picture and the camera refocuses. And most of the time focus is fine and it's completely fine, but then there's every once in a while where it gets a little confused and you either A, have to wait for it to figure out focus or B, it gets so confused and it focuses on something someplace else. You should be choosing your focus point so you're minimizing that but back button focus takes it a further step and you are removing from the camera's brain the need to focus unless you tell it to focus. And I want you to drive your camera. Camera drive you. I, used to, I learned how to back up a trailer many years ago. And the tip was you drive the trailer, don't let the trailer drive you. We had a couple, I know we're running long here, but we had a couple questions that people took the time to ask over on Facebook. Joe Witzgullfish wants to buy the 70 to 200 F2.8 for her 70D, but is it 4.48 instead because of the crop factor? Yes, it is. So she says, well, can you suggest another lens? No. So this is this issue, and um, you know I think Tony, Tony Northrup has popularized this recently, and he's completely right. You do have to multiply crop factor times your aperture as well, but they're all the same. I mean, there are, there's no wider options than the 70 to f2.8 on a crop sensor. There just aren't, so what are you gonna do? I mean, this is what everybody's been using for millions of years. And yes, the camera manufacturers... Millions of years, you guys. Millions of years. <laughs> um, yes, the camera manufacturers should update their dang on literature. I mean, it's so confusing for poor people that all of the millimeters printed on the lenses are equivalent to full frame. It took me forever to wrap my head around that, and I still get that question very frequently. You know, so this lens is made for only a crop camera. It says 18 millimeters. Don't I get 18 millimeters? No, you get 18 times your crop factor. I know, why, why, why? And the same with the aperture. But what are you gonna do about it? Make yourself a different lens. I mean. Oh, I see what you're saying. I, there's, just, there's just nothing else. The 70 to 200 F2.8 is a fantastic lens. It's gonna do well on your camera. If you are looking for that focal length, that focal length, and as wide an aperture as you can get, in the there you go. You could go to a prime, like the 135 f2, so that's going to be a little bit of a wider aperture, uh, but still, you do have to multiply the crop factor times that as well. So, yep. Kevin wants to know how to clean his camera. He spent and shooting seascapes. He's got some challenging weather situations, so he's got a little bit of salt spray on his gear now. I'd say a very lightly damp cloth, uh, clean water, and just gently, very, just barely damp, just enough to take the salt bits off gently. And for the lenses, you can get cleaning solution and things of that sort, but you can also just go on it. Yep. Yeah. What else? 
Max Jordan, well, this is a longer one. I, I almost could have answered this in my NX1 review that's coming out, is in this conundrum. They've got an NX30 they love. They're thinking about the NX1, but they will Samsung come out with a full frame camera? This is the problem with going with these kind of newer cameras and these ecosystems that are limited. We just don't know. We don't know. So he says, should I go with Sony? It's funny saying Sony's the safer choice, but in this comparison, I think Sony is the safer choice. They clearly have full frame cameras. They're committing to full frame. We have no idea if Samsung is going to commit to full frame or stay as a crop sensor. Just don't know. So I think that's it. There's two more comments, but they won't pop open because Okay. They won't pop open. So oh, last question by popular demand. Mm -hmm. Look at this. Mugs. The mugs. Yeah. You guys have been asking about these. So we do plan to sell them to you if you want them. Uh, we are hoping to have them within the next month available in the store. For you. Keep your eyes out for that. We'll definitely announce it and keep you posted. Uh, but we'll Keep it top secret. Nobody will know. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to come to our website every day and check the shop page right. to see when they're available. Right. No, just kidding. But yes, we will have them. If you want one, you will definitely be able to get one. Good. And I think that's it All right. for tonight. Yep. Thank you, everybody, for watching. We really appreciate you commenting and liking this video that's right. and uh, interacting in the chat. It's really fun, sometimes distracting. To follow the conversation I, I, there. I did not see it much today because it is very distracting. I'm distracted enough by the audio issues. But if I didn't follow the chat, then how would we know that there, we were having audio uh, problems? That is true. So Yes, I know. Anyway. Hmm. So Someday. thank you guys for watching. <laughs> and now this is the awkward part of the day. I don't think it's awkward. Or evening no. when we just linger. Can we talk about what we're having for dinner? I'm really hungry. We're having dinner mm. yep do you guys remember the bloopers do you miss the bloopers we used to do the bloopers i wasn't a fan of the bloopers i got in trouble for some of the bloopers i put up um yes because you weren't a fan and we did the meerkat streaming at the beginning too uh trilina i think was the one who told us clearly does not the, i looked at it on the desktop and it is like this much the camera was the, the phone was sitting way over there and from the back of the screen was perfect behind the scenes here we are sitting similar to what you're seeing but from an angle but the meerkat desktop app is was like my head and chin super cropped yeah so i stopped that we'll go back and look at that again talk to folks at live stream this week which offer a variety of really cool products. Uh, some Wi-Fi streaming direct to YouTube and their own streaming system. Pretty neat. So I we'll hope to have some more information about that soon. Yeah. And you know what happens when it's really long is people come along and they look at it and they go, there's a nerdy camera talk. I don't want to watch that. But they can skip. I know. People can skip. They, can. they don't have to watch the whole thing. I can't. And maybe someday we'll have a completely, completely bug free, bug free show. Show. Maybe someday. Yeah. Gotta get some of those cockroaches in here with their long exposure eyeballs. Get those bugs For in here. For what? I don't know. I just wanted just to creep me out. <laughs> just wanted to tie it to bugs. That is not gonna be a fun show for anybody. <laughs> we could. Yep. Okay. And sorry, the cats didn't make an appearance. Yeah. We can't control that. No, we can't. They're very much uh, cats. As honest they do though, what they want. Bean almost knocked the NX1 off the table this week. And that really upset you. Well, that <laughs> really upset me, but it scared me a little bit. Uh, okay. Okay. Thumbs up, you guys. Take your thumbs watching. up. Put in the comments what focal length would you shoot at for the next year? What two focal lengths? You got two to choose from. Just two. Mine came to me right away. I'll the two I would use. And they may slightly be um, influenced by me thinking about lenses, but try to separate it from lenses. Think that you'd have, just have two magical lenses or one magical lens that only shot at these and that they would be sharp and focus and fast and maybe lightweight or whatever. Don't worry about that. Just think about what you could limit yourself to and be happy. Thanks for watching, folks.
Thanks for thumbs and up. Thanks for commenting. See you next week.